Genocide in Tibet by John Sayles. In 1950, what is known as the Genocide in Tibet would begin, and over the course of nine years, the entire government and culture would be completely destroyed and overthrown by the communist Chinese government, along with the murder of 1.2 million Tibetans and the exiling of 100,000 more. To understand how something of this proportion could happen to a civilization that has existed for over 2,000 years, you have to learn their history and relationship with China first. Part 1. Introduction to Tibetan History and the Beginning of the Genocide Since the introduction of Tibet to the world and up until 1911, China and Tibet remained relatively peaceful, largely in part to a peace treaty drafted between King Stongsten Gompo, the leader of the Chinese Yarlung dynasty in Tibet at some point between 1821 and 1823, which stated, Tibetans shall be happy in Tibet and Chinese shall be happy in China. And despite the relatively tumultuous history and conflict between 1821 and 1911, most notably the rise and fall of the Mongol Empire and the inclusion of the British, the treaty would remain stable, and the relationship between China and Tibet would remain largely unchanged for the, almost the whole course of their history. Unfortunately, this would change in 1911 following the Chinese Revolution of 1911 and the subsequent fall of the Qing Dynasty, who had at that point been ruling over China since 1644. After the fall of the Qing Dynasty, whatever ties the Dalai Lama, which is an official name of the ruler of Tibet, and China had fallen apart. While there was no longer any official relationship between the two, Tibet would avoid any and all foreign influence for almost 38 years, acting as an independent state. The turning point for Tibet's peace would occur in 1949 when the People's Liberation Army, the Armed Forces for the People's Republic of China, began to invade Tibet. You might be asking, why would China invade Tibet? What could have possibly been the point? Well, China had stated Tibet was a, quote, hell on earth, ravaged by feudal exploitation, and their society consisted of oppressive monks living off the backs of a large and impoverished population of peasants. And to be frank, China deciding to help Tibet would have made some sense. But weirdly, it wasn't accurate at all. While Tibet did have many issues within its society stemming from nationalism, a lot of what China had said was just not true. For one, China had wrongly thought that Tibet was ruled by a hereditary line, when in actuality, the Dalai Lama, who was believed to be a reincarnate of the previous Dalai Lama, was chosen out of the ordinary population each year. This might have been a strategy to come off as more egalitarian, but the ordinary population could still move up. Also, Tibet wasn't a completely feudal nation. Every peasant had rights and a legal identity, and any Tibetan could try others in a court of law, even their masters. To be fair, China might not have known this, but they also did not have proof of the contrary. Either way, their invasion resulted in the defeat of Tibet's small central army and the occupation of over half their country. Furthermore, China imposed the 17-point agreement for peaceful liberation of Tibet for Tibet's government in May 1951. As a side note, while Tibet may have agreed at the time with the quote-unquote agreement, it was and still is not valid under international law. Because of the threat of immediate occupation in Lhasa, Tibet's capital city, and the fact that there were more than 40,000 Chinese troops currently inside the country, they were given basically no choice but to agree. The agreement was, needless to say, not great for Tibet. The agreement allowed for China's army to enter Tibetan territory whenever they pleased, gave them control over Tibet's foreign affairs, and took a share of Tibet's eastern territories. Part 2. The Genocide Subsequent to the agreement, China rolled into eastern Tibet in order to start collective agricultural areas that you may associate with the Great Leap Forward. Hence, it was bad. Tibet obviously began to rebel, with China responding by killing and incarcerating thousands of Tibetans. As the rebellion began to flow into central Tibet in 1959, China began to take its second move, and the current Dalai Lama and many other Tibetan refugees fled into India where, fun fact, they still reside today, in exile. As punishment for the rebellion, China began to introduce what they would call a regime of struggle onto Tibet. What would follow this declaration was a series of moves made by China to quell Tibet from any more uprisings. They would denounce, torture, and execute anyone who was seen as enemies of the people, and by the end, 92,000 plus Tibetans have been killed this way. 
Many other Tibetans, especially males, would later meet their deaths in forced labor camps within the Chinese provinces of Qinghai and Sichuan. Tibetan citizens were made to mine precious metals and build infrastructure like roads and railways in high frozen altitudes, along with little to no food. Tens of thousands of Tibetans would die due to these camps between 1960 and 1965. Around only 2% of them would return to their homelands or were alive. Tibet would not be given a break even after the labor camps, as in 1966, China would unveil what they would call the Great Proletarian Revolution, which sought to quash Tibetan culture and any signs of their previous civilization because it was seen as futile and reactionary. Temples, monasteries, and holy sites like Zhou Kang and Ramoshe would be condemned and destroyed. Thousands of monks and nuns would be systematically murdered through Tibet, the most bloody being in Dre Peng with 10,000 dead and Gan Den with 3,000. Religious festivals and songs that originated in Tibet were also banned, and any remaining religious figures would be murdered, resulting in more than 10,000 dead. Part 3. The Aftermath Finally, after almost 20 years, the genocide along with the Cultural Revolution began to die down in 1969 after the death of Mao Zedong, who had been a key figure in both. Following this, China actually began to soften on Tibet's cultural and national rights during the 1980s with the support of the West in their transformation of the Chinese economy and society. Unfortunately for Tibet, the damage had already been done. Tibetans became a minority in Lhasa and many initiatives to fight against the few religious institutions that were still allowed to continue like strike hard had been ingrained within the capital city. While some Tibetan rebellious groups still continued within secret, they would still create revolts occasionally. The most noticeable post-genocide demonstration occurring in 1989, which was quickly taken down by Chinese government with torture tactics. Part 4. The Consequences all in all, an estimated 1.2 million Tibetans were killed by China. It had been decided by the International Commission of Jurists that what had occurred was in fact a genocide under the 1948 Genocide Convention, and China had purposely killed and exiled Tibetans with the intent of wiping them out. There have been some goals set to help Tibetan recovering from what they had experienced, including a five-point plan that was made by the Dalai Lama in 1987 to U.S. Congress, stating the following, transformation of the whole of Tibet into a zone of peace, abandonment of China's population transfer policy, which threatens the very experience of the Tibetan people, respect for the Tibetan people's fundamental human rights and democratic freedoms, Restoration of Tibet's environment and not allowing China to dump nuclear waste and nuclear weapons there anymore. And finally, allowing negotiations between the future status of Tibet and the relationship with China. Surprisingly, many Tibetans are still willing to continue under China autonomously instead of wanting complete independence. However, even this condition may not be accepted by China, considering they are still increasing their military presence within the region and the economic ambitions they harbor. Part 5. The End when stepping away from what happened in Tibet and taking in what has occurred since, it is hard to say what the outcome will be. With luck, Tibet may be given the peace and freedom they want, but at the present, it seems quite unlikely. This is in part due to the complexity of genocide. The consequences that are sown when something of this proportion occurs does not always fade, and a sure and just end is not always defined. So, when learning about genocide, it is important to remember that while the worst may end, the echoes that follow will never really fade. Thank you for listening.